Welcome to Get Rich Education. I'm your host, Keith Weinhold. Fees and volatility have an outsized impact on your long-term rate of return. Then what is perhaps the number one property investment state in all of America today on Get Rich Education? The company that's provided our listeners with more loans than anyone is Ridge Lending Group and MLS 42056. You can finance more than 10 single families up to fourplexes serving most U.S. states. Their knowledge and experience leads to your financial freedom. They're number one in the investment space. Pre-qualify and then chat with President Chaley Ridge personally. Start on your next investment property loan right now at RidgeLendingGroup.com. Finally, Total Control Financial gives you checkbook control of your 401k and IRA money to invest in real estate. It's time to get your retirement money into your own checking account, but you've got to avoid the little known tax that you'll pay with any self directed IRA. Instead, it's time for the QRP. Learn more and get your free copy of the QRP book by text messaging QRP in all capital letters to 72000. You're listening to the show that has created more financial freedom than nearly any show in the world. This is Get Rich Education. Welcome to Get Rich Education. I'm your host, Keith Weinhold. The scarce mindset says get debt free. Work hard for decades is something that you're not even passionate about in order to get debt free. And I won't even listen to any other way. The abundant mindset says, keep your debt. In fact, get more of it, outsource it all to tenants and use that debt to create cash flow, leverage, arbitrage, and velocity for yourself. The scarce mindset says, defer your quality of life. The abundant mindset says, Maybe defer just a little, but generally improve your quality of life both now and in the future. And why would you choose to live any other way? You know something? I wonder what the I want to be debt free crowd would say if negative interest rates were introduced to the United States like they have been in some other parts of the world. You know what? I don't think that crowd would change their tune one bit. And why do I think this? Well, because again, people are more into affirmation than they are information. And secondly, because in this era of already low interest rates, some people still want to retire their debt. When interest rates are less than the real rate of inflation, now you're being paid to borrow and you lose purchasing power when you save. Negative interest rates could make that condition obvious to lay people and pretty plain to see that you're being paid to borrow and you lose purchasing power when you save. But I don't think it matters to the debt-free at all costs crowd. People just have a hard time admitting that they're wrong. They stay affirmed rather than be informed. As we're discussing both stocks and real estate today, we're also going to discuss what might be the number one state in the United States for real estate investing with a great guest. I think really a discussion around stocks and mutual funds is as much about unlearning as it is about learning. Well, it's so good to have Maureen back on the show today. Welcome to Get Rich Education. Thank you, Keith. It's always a pleasure to come back and to talk with you and your listeners because whenever I get to chat with you, it is like new ideas just spark in my mind because of the caliber and quality of the investment knowledge that you have. So it is a privilege, honor, and thrill to be here. Hey, thanks so much. Your enthusiasm has rubbed off on our listeners for years as well. Maureen, we do a fair bit of talking offline as well. I know a lot of the reading that you do has to do with stock investing versus real estate investing and mutual fund managers and just how they're incentivized. Tell us more about what you found in your reading about stock investing and kind of how traditional investing works. Get ready for this. So I am an avid reader and I read Tony Robbins' book for a second time called Unshakable. Yeah. And I want to kick myself because the first time I read it, I remember reading John Bogle 
who is the CEO of Vanguard, right. manages $3 trillion with a T under assets under management. So I think this guy knows a little something about what he's talking about, much more than I do. I'm not a mutual fund. I have money in mutual funds, probably not after I read this chapter. And <laughs> I kind of followed the traditional financial advisor, told me what to do. I invested in mutual funds. And then I read John Bogle's words. And here's what he said. Well, let me just give you the example he presented in the book. Let's say you and I both invest $100,000 at the same time. We earn the same return. We start withdrawing the same amount of money at the same time. Okay. The only difference is, Keith, is you paid 1% in management fees, and I paid 2% in management fees. Now, side note, I called my financial advisor when I finished this chapter, and I said, what am I paying my money manager in fees? And he said, 2.2%. So you're listeners, and you are going to realize how much this stings right now for me. So here it is. Ready? (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, let's hear it. Everything is the same, except you pay 1%, I pay 2%. I run out of money 10 years sooner than you do because I paid 1% higher in fees to my active money manager. That's astounding. That delta compounds over time. Correct. Because, you know, in my mind, I'm like, oh, 1%, 2%. Does that even make a difference? Well, when you throw years and compounding onto that equation, 10 years of me running out of money sooner than you, that is not a good deal for me. What I learned from that book, my financial advisor is not going to be very happy because I am changing a lot of things and redirecting those funds into something that I know, which is real estate and passive income, because passive income can pay bills and design a lifestyle for me. And paying fees to my money manager only designs his life. (laughs) (laughs) That's right. You're looking out for him more than you're looking out for yourself, maybe. I haven't owned any stocks, bonds, or mutual funds for years. If I did, I'd probably still be working a work a day job. So you're talking about the impact of fees on mutual fund returns. I've often stated that there are about five simultaneous drags on mutual fund and stock type returns. Inflation, emotion, taxes, the fees that you mentioned, and then volatility. I've been doing a presentation and I have one PowerPoint slide that shows the effect, the deleterious effect of volatility on something that compounds annually. And I think we're all used to seeing that curved line of compound interest. It curves and it goes higher and it goes up substantially such as you think that, oh, I need to invest in something that produces compound interest. But the difference between what you think you're getting as an investor with compound interest and what you're really getting is diluted with volatility such that, say, a 6% return over time and how that looks in compound interest versus a 6% return with what you're really getting. What you're really getting is what this data shows over 100 years with the stock market is only about 38% of what you think you're getting with compound interest. And the reason for that is this compound interest line that looks like it goes parabolic that's if you got a 6% return every single year, year after year, 6% return. But the smaller line that only gives you 38% of your full return, that's if you get 9% one year and minus 2% one year and 4% the next year and 5% the next year, but it all averages out to 6%. You didn't get 6% every year. So what's the difference? It's that mathematical difference. When you lose 50% of the value of something, you need to gain 100% just to get back to where you were. That's just math. So this time that it takes for an investor's portfolio to recover is not the same as making money. And real estate is substantially more stable than these volatile stocks. So that's more behind how volatility is deleterious. It's inflation, emotion, taxes, fees, and volatility. That's why I'm not in the market. That was such a beautiful summary. And I subscribe to that thinking 100%. It's funny, I subscribe to that thinking 100%, but my actions were not doing that, right? (laughs) Right, right. And so now it's like, whoo, my financial advisor is not going to be happy with me when I call him because things are changing, but all for my benefit and for my family's benefit. And that's the way it should be. I wanted to touch on, you mentioned uh, compound interest. It was kind of a trigger for me because it makes me think of something that I had read along the way about the three ways that you create wealth. And I'd love to hear what you think about this too. But compound interest is one way, but it's not the only way. But I think a lot of us in the United States have been trained to think that that's the only way. You got to put money in a 401k and let it 
for years, and then you can start drawing on it 30 years from now, assuming that you were getting a 6 or 8% return each year. But then again, I like what you said, that's just the average. One year, it could be minus 2%. The next year, it could be plus 9%. So there's some deficits that need to be made up over time. But the three ways that you create wealth, compound interest is one, velocity of money is the second. I always like to think of if you're, you be the bank, lend money out. Let's say you have $25,000, you lend that out for 90 days, you get that back with plus 10%. You do that again the next quarter, and then you roll that out four times in a year, you get that money back plus 10%. That's the velocity of money. You're moving money and creating wealth. And then the last, which is, it just falls beautifully right into real estate is amortization or leverage. And that is using a little bit of your money, a lot of someone else's money, and then having the debt paid down by a tenant. You have the compound interest, velocity of money, amortization, our wealth building tools. And then you add that with some of those tax saving strategies that your good friend Tom Wilwright talks a lot about on your show. Now you've got the perfect combination of creating wealth, in my opinion. Compound interest works mathematically. It's just that when volatility is introduced, it doesn't work in real life. I think mutual fund managers, what they do is they just get their clients asking all the wrong questions. They've conditioned clients to ask questions like, what should my allocation of stocks be versus my allocation in bonds? Or should I sign up for the target date retirement 2040 fund or the target date retirement 2045 fund? I mean, this is how they have conditioned people to think and the questions that they need to ask them. Interestingly, mutual fund managers typically make money whether you, the investor, make it or lose it. You just said something that made me think about this. In the line of work that I do in the turnkey rental space, I will tell you, Keith, that the majority of my phone calls are people, investors, from ages typically 40 to 60. And what just sort of popped into my head with what you said was, yeah. if compound interest was working, they wouldn't be calling me looking for solutions for cash flow because they don't have enough money to live in their retirement years. If compound interest worked, I wouldn't be getting phone calls. Right. Well, so much of this is about liquidity. And of course, mutual funds aren't even designed to to give you the liquidity. And of course, real estate is. But yeah, I mean, you bring up an important point that if mutual funds provided some great retirements for people, we would not be in a retirement crisis, which is what we're in today. But it's really been that 35 or 40 years when 401ks have had mainstream adoption. That's now trickling through to retirees. And that's exactly why we have a retirement crisis. So people see other retirees not getting the outcome that they thought they were going to get. But that's how young people still invest today, despite that outcome. Interesting. Yeah. It's the brainwashing. It's the dogma. It's the wrong vernacular that people are using. Yeah. And so we have to change it. I'm with you. Ah, oh, I love it. Brilliant. <laughs> well, yeah. So, well, luckily we're not into that type of investing. Of course, you're an extraordinary turnkey provider with properties and identifying what's going to secure an income stream for that investor. What's interesting is I think a lot of times a landlord has to go qualify a tenant once they have a property, but you, the turnkey provider, before any of that happens, you are basically qualifying a neighborhood and purchasing properties in the right neighborhood for the investor. So tell us more about that neighborhood selection. There really are 10 critical factors for a profitable rental property in the right neighborhood. So I just make it very simple. Number one, the type of neighborhood equals the type of tenant you're going to attract. So if you've got nice green spaces, you've got nice open parks, you've got amenities that are close by that make it convenient for families to get to the grocery store or take their kids to the movies, etc. That's going to score high. You're going to attract the type of tenant that is attracted to that nice type of environment, the neighborhood. So that's number one. Number two, property taxes. This is a big one. It's not about what you make, it's what you keep. And the US uh, government would like to take as much money out of our pockets as they possibly can. But what I've learned from your really good friend, Robert Kiyosaki, is the US tax code is not a penal code. It is a behavioral code. Right. You behave in certain ways then the government will give you the benefit of taking less money from you. So well said. Thank you. So I listened to him very well. I listened to it many times. And so if you do certain things like help the US grow agriculture here domestically, if you help drill for domestic oil and gas domestically, we have less dependency on 
importing it from other countries. If we provide housing, much needed housing for the residents of the U.S., we get benefits such as depreciation of that structure every year for 27 and a half years. We can defer capital gains through the 1031 exchange. So penal code, no. It feels like a penal code if you're a W-2. You only have so many deductions. But if you are a business owner, entrepreneur, real estate investor, there are ways that you can keep more money in your pocket. So property taxes is key. In the state of Alabama, I think the state is actually the lowest in property taxes in the nation. Mississippi might beat us. I don't know. I haven't looked at their data yet. But property taxes is huge because that's less money out of your pocket. I was actually looking at that just the other day. Hawaii has the lowest property tax rate in the nation, but Alabama has the lowest property taxes overall because Alabama properties in general are less expensive than Hawaii ones. So you're spot on with what you're talking about. So therefore, Alabama has the second lowest property tax rate in the nation at just 0.43%. (laughs) <laughs> of assessed value, which is astounding. And of course, for an out-of-state investor that owns Alabama property, of course, you're the beneficiary of those low rates. But tell us more about identifying that right neighborhood as the turnkey provider, much like a landlord would need to qualify the right tenant. Correct. So besides the property taxes, schools are a big one, especially if you're dealing with family size, single family rental properties like we are. The quality of schools doesn't necessarily attract or is it really that important to the renter. And I should say that it's it's not the most important. It's important to them. It's just not the most important. Affordability and proximity to work are the two main factors why renters choose a property. School is typically ranked third. And that's just my sort of experience with leasing properties over time. I've heard the conversations. But when you're picking that right neighborhood, property taxes is important. The schools on the resale value. That's why. So number four is crime. It's very easy to check your local police crime statistics. You want to check the rates of vandalism, serious crimes, petty crimes. And you just want to note if the activity is going up or down, right? So you want to kind of just get a sense of what's happening in that particular neighborhood. Yeah. Number five, job market. The locations, you basically want locations with growing employment opportunities to attract more tenants. Um, The U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics is great for finding this information out. And just kind of simply look at your headlines in the newspaper or on social media. Look for announcements from large companies moving in an area, like the FBI is relocating from D.C. to Huntsville. D.C. Blocks is a huge technology, IT-based, cloud-based company. They've relocated their headquarters to Birmingham. Amazon uh, is opening a distribution center in Bessemer, Alabama. You read the headlines, headlines, here's a job or here's a company moving. That means jobs. That means people will have money to pay your rent. It's pretty Um, simple, but it can't be overlooked. No, precisely. Number six is just the amenities. I kind of mentioned this a little bit earlier. Parks, restaurants, grocery stores, public transportation. You want to know that it's there and not so rural that it's out of reach, that it would be a little bit harder to rent this property. Number seven is future development. What's happening in the community? Municipal planning departments are great to get this kind of information from. If you look in the sky and you see cranes, construction equals growth. That means there's some good things happening in there. (laughs) Pretty simple. Number eight is just the number of listings and vacancies. If you see an exorbitant amount of listings and then you're watching those listings over time and you're seeing the rents come down, you either have a seasonal issue or you actually have a bigger issue that's happening in that area. Number nine is the average rent, right? You want to make sure that your rent is going to be able to cover all of your expenses and leave some cash flow at the end of the day. And then number 10, many people probably don't think about this one, but natural disasters. Insurance is a big part of owning a property and what the expense is going to be as you subtract it from your returns. So you want to know, is it in a flood zone? Are there prone to earthquakes? Are there wildfires? Are there tornadoes? Any of those types of things you want to be aware of. So when you're picking the right neighborhood, all of these things need to come into play. We as a turnkey operator, we really do look at all of these factors and then identify the markets that will produce the highest yield in areas that have economic growth, that have accessibility to freeways and roadways and have future development and all kinds of good things that will help insulate and secure the investment. 
The neighborhood that you buy your property in as the investor is so important because it's quite difficult for your home to change the neighborhood that it's in. And some of these things are so simple, like the right neighborhood will attract the right tenant, but it can't be overlooked. You're listening to Get Rich Education. We're talking about Alabama real estate, one of the most investor advantaged states in the entire nation. More when we come back. I'm your host, Keith Weinhold. Would you like to know the easiest way to create wealth and passive income with real estate? This is Marco Santorelli with Norada Real Estate Investments. Now you can access the best deals without the stress or hassle of having to find, renovate, or manage those properties. We save you time by providing you with passive income investment properties in some of the best U.S. markets. Learn more by downloading your free copy of The Ultimate Guide to Passive Real Estate Investing. There's no obligation and nothing to buy. Simply visit PassiveRealEstateGuide.com and get your free copy today. That's PassiveRealEstateGuide.com. Countless property investors get killed with maintenance costs, but that's far less likely when you buy brand new construction. Let me tell you about JWB Real Estate Capital in Jacksonville, Florida. They pioneered the build-to-rent model where you can invest in new construction turnkey rental properties. That's why JWB was featured on the front page of the Wall Street Journal. To learn more and see inventory, go to newconstructionturnkey.com. Hi, this is Russell Gray, co-host of the Real Estate Guys radio show, and you're listening to Get Rich Education with Keith Weinhold. Don't quit your daydream. Welcome back to Get Rich Education. We're talking about real estate investing, especially the opportunity that's in Alabama and how it may now have set itself apart as the most investor advantaged real estate state in the United States. Tell us more about the Alabama climate overall, especially with respect to a real estate investor. Aha. Uh-huh. So, so some of the things, Alabama economy looks really strong right now. So if you just look at the unemployment numbers, 3.8% in the state of Alabama versus 3.9% in the United States, the job growth is projected at 2.0%. And then the future job growth, Keith, is estimated at 32.4% compared to the overall U.S. at 33%. So you can see there's a lot of future job growth in the state of Alabama. And interestingly enough, those tariffs kind of worked in our favor. And manufacturing, one of the largest employers in Alabama is manufacturing. And manufacturing is up 6% in the state. So you're seeing just a lot of phenomenal growth in the state itself and how it relates to the investor. What does the investor want? We want a solid, consistent year over year rate of return. We want consistent cash flow, and you're going to get consistent cash flow If you've got people that have jobs that are wanting to live in those places. And so with an established company that's already there, voila, you have a system that you can plug into and collect that cash flow, which really helps that very busy professional still do what they're doing, earn their capital and then roll it into investments that give them cash flow each month. And you might remember, it was a couple years ago since he said it now, but global geopolitical strategist Peter Zion, when he was on the show, he told us that the number one U.S. state for per capita foreign direct investment in the entire U.S. is Alabama. It's number one. It's not some of these other places like New York or California or Texas, like you might be thinking. And yeah, Alabama has those rent to value ratios that work, just simply a rent to value ratio that's advantageous for an investor. Now, when you take a metric that's so simple, like rent-to-value ratio, you need to look beyond that. So rent and purchase price are the two most important criteria for an investor. Thirdly, it's property tax. And then fourthly, it's a mortgage interest rate. Well, the mortgage interest rate, that's just going to be what it's going to be. But the third one, the property tax, like we already touched, that's why the numbers work especially well in Alabama, because you, as an out-of-state investor, of course, you get to be the beneficiary of those low property tax rates. Whatever state you live in, when you own property there, you only have to pay that low property tax rate. So Tell us more about landlord-tenant law in Alabama. It's so friendly to the landlord in the state. There is no staying and not paying. You're not paying. You're not staying. (laughs) We're just going to get you moving along. So it's a very, very quick process, honestly. I mean, if we don't have rent by day 10, that's when the eviction notice is posted. The state of Alabama tells us as property managers, we have to give the tenant seven business days to cure the debt. If after those seven business days, we still don't have all of the funds plus the late fees, the eviction continues, 
And essentially, we can get them out of the property in less than 60 days. Yeah, that is pretty quick. Now, historically, you've been based in Birmingham, Alabama with your company. So before we discuss the unveiling of the new market that you also operate in within Alabama, let's talk about Birmingham. And that's a city that Forbes, CNN Money, and Rent Range have all indicated is poised for prosperity. Tell us more. (laughs) <laughs> this is the little unsung hero that everyone's kind of ignored for a long time. And I love it because the returns that I can offer my investors are quite high because it's not saturated yet, I guess. Maybe after your show, it might be saturated. <laughs> 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 but I will tell you, the, the economics are strong in Birmingham. And it really comes down to the state, local and government officials have really been, they led the charge with something that you talked about earlier with the foreign investment capital that Peter shared on your show, these guys, when you have to revitalize and rebuild a city, you've got to go find jobs. And that's exactly what they did. They were fierce in their pursuit. They went overseas. They got these large auto manufacturing companies to set up billion dollar plants that have been very effective and employed, employed a lot of people. Now, and I say now, but let me just kind of dial back about two to three years ago, they started the same vigorous, fierce pursuit in the technology space. So you can find headlines, just Google, you can find the headlines, Birmingham being the next sort of described Silicon Valley of the Southeast. There is a dedicated group called the Innovation Depot Acceleration Program. And essentially what this does is it helps go out and find, fund, transport, provide boot camps, educational resources, so that you go out and you find the best talent in technology bring them to Birmingham. They get kind of farmed into this technology incubator called the Innovation Depot. And it's a think tank incubator for technology startups. They get a lot of resource and incredible work environment. They get in-residence entrepreneur mentor to show them how to launch their products. They get access to marketing dollars. And so a lot of people probably heard of the company called Shipt, S-H-I-P-T. Be careful. Yes, be careful. Shift. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> You've got to enunciate clearly here. Right. And shift, very short, very briefly, it was purchased by Target to compete with Walmart and Amazon for home delivery of goods. It is an e commerce company based in Birmingham. Rapid expansion, going nuts. And the Innovation Depot Acceleration Program has been influential in attracting great talent uh, to that organization. There's a gal, her name is Brittany Springville. She is in charge of going out and attracting and inviting CEOs, mostly of Silicon Valley, to come to Birmingham to show them what we can do as a city for them with either opening up a satellite office, starting a new company, or expanding operations. And she had her first Birmingham-bound event. She had five CEOs of Silicon Valley-based tech companies come. Three actually opened up offices in the Innovation Depot. One company is called Prepaid to Cash. They relocated their entire headquarters from California to Birmingham because of the incentives and the support that the city is giving these tech startup companies. So they are vigorously, Birmingham is going after and they want to be the next big tech giant in the United States. Yeah, they're very forward thinking. And of course, in Birmingham, it's more than just technology. It's manufacturing, it's medical. They have a pretty well diversified economy there. But more recently, you've expanded into a new MSA, a new metropolitan statistical area. So you now serve both this new place and Birmingham. And we're talking about a place in northern Alabama. It's an MSA that's almost up into Tennessee. So it's not a Birmingham suburb. It's about a 90-minute drive time north. And this place, this MSA, it's about equidistant between Nashville, Tennessee, and Birmingham. In fact, if you were to draw a triangle between Atlanta, Nashville, and Birmingham, this place is right inside that triangle. Tell us about this new market. (laughs) <laughs> the drum roll, please. The unveiling. If no one can guess it, it is Huntsville, Alabama. And this is known as the Rocket City. It is an established aerospace and manufacturing hub in the United States. There are huge capital investments from you know, new companies calling Huntsville home, such as the Toyota Mazda $1.6 billion manufacturing plant that selected Huntsville as their home base, bringing with it 4,000 new jobs. 
And you can catch another headline. The FBI is relocating from D.C. to Huntsville, Alabama. And they're opening up a new communications operations center in the Redstone Arsenal, bringing with it 4,000 new jobs. So we just have more and more people moving into this area. A little side note, U.S. News Report ranked Huntsville number 11 out of 125 metro areas as the best place to live. There is so much happening in Huntsville that it only made sense. It was a calling for us to get up there and start offering investors an opportunity to capture cash flow rental properties up in that market. To give you a little bit of insight, I got a call from a realtor there. Yeah. Carol yeah. is her name. And she called me because she's got a problem, a big one, and she's trying to solve it. And her problem is she is getting calls from Facebook executives and upper management, FBI upper management and executives, they're looking for rental properties because they're relocating from other areas. They don't know where they want to buy yet. They know this area called Madison is where they want to live because that's where the schools, the best schools are ranked. In the Western part of the Huntsville MSA, yes. Yes. And so she is calling me because she doesn't have enough properties to rent them. She's got a waiting list right now, Keith, of people wanting to rent properties in Huntsville. That's remarkable. And that's as real as it gets. That's not reading a report even. No, that's ground communication, right? Yeah. This is Carolyn saying, Maureen, I've got a problem. Do you have investors that would want to buy? She and her husband, he's a construction company. They own a construction company. She said, we can build it and your investors could buy it and then they can rent it out. And she goes, I would have them already rented even before they closed. And I was like, oh my gosh, like there's so many exciting things happening in Huntsville. Here's a quick little snapshot of just the businesses, right? I already mentioned Toyota Mazda. Blue Origin Manufacturing Plant is in commercial manufacturing. That's a $200 million project. Construction starts started July 2019. The Bocar Group, it's a commercial manufacturing, $118 million investment. It's under renovation. The Facebook Data Center, that's a $750 million investment. That's completed. And then one of the largest residential retail and hospitality centers throughout the entire United States is called Mid-City. And it's a $350 million project. And that is in Mid-City, Huntsville, Alabama. Yeah, that's remarkable. And it sure has become an aerospace hub. And I think a lot of people might know with Elon Musk and entrepreneurs like that, the aerospace industry has become more privatized, but this is good that there are substantial drivers in Huntsville beyond just the aerospace industry. And some people may not realize it, but we're talking about a place, the Huntsville metro area with an MSA population of almost half a million people, almost 500,000 people there. So it's not a small place and there is affordable housing there, just like there is in most of Alabama. In fact, only 19% of median household income in Huntsville is spent on housing. I know in Huntsville, you buy in B and B plus areas there. They're single family homes that generally have price points between 85K and 125K. And you have an average tenant stay of more than three years, part of that because of the robust job growth. 100%. When you look at sort of comparing Huntsville and Birmingham, they both offer an investor great quality cash flow rental properties. What's interesting, there's a lot of economic indices that point if Huntsville continues on its growth trajectory, it will surpass Birmingham as a larger MSA. I did not know that. It's crazy. And then when you go and because I visit Huntsville very frequently, it is a clean, beautiful, pristine city. It is aesthetically just so beautiful to look at. And when you see all of that, there's lots of construction crews and cranes. There's just a lot that's happening. Like I said earlier, construction equals growth. And when you see growth, you know that there's good things happening economically and locally. What about management? These two MSAs, Birmingham near the center of the state and then Huntsville in the north are 90 minutes apart. And you've done a great job over the years of taking care of Get Rich Education followers in Birmingham. I would imagine that you have separate property management up in Huntsville since it is more geographically disparate from Birmingham. Yes. So we actually have a property manager there. She is works from home. We don't even have our office set up there yet, but that will be coming. We don't really need that yet. 
just because we've started, we've got, we're about 35, almost 40 homes right now. As soon as we get to 50, we know we're opening up an office. (laughs) So that's kind of the plan. But so far, so good. The diversity of what Huntsville and what Birmingham offers an investor. I mean, just to give you an example, if you look at the 10-year historical housing appreciation rates in Birmingham, they have been a very modest 25 to 3%. And according to Zillow, I looked it up here just recently, Zillow shows that Birmingham has a housing appreciation of currently 4.6%. We've seen the values increase when we've flipped almost a thousand doors now. In Birmingham, we've definitely seen the values increase over our five-year term. What will Huntsville offer? If you've got this crazy growth trajectory that's happening, what will that presumably do? It's very speculative, right? And I'm a cash flow girl, period. I want to make sure that everyone knows that. I'm not a speculative investor in residential real estate. In some startup apps, yes, but not in residential real estate. There is this thing, appreciation, that is part of the five ways that you earn in real estate. And what is going to be a better market long-term with a higher potential upside? My, I'm leaning towards Huntsville just because of what we're seeing from a growth advantage point. All right. The five ways you're paid, a true get rich education reader. <laughs> I love that. I, that is like the best. I share that with all of my clients. I promote you because I just love your brilliance. But that, once you get that, once you understand the five ways that real estate pays you, it is a major compelling reason for why you should invest in real estate without a doubt. Yeah. And I can't believe more people don't talk about that. Well, Maureen, any last thoughts about Alabama overall or Birmingham or Huntsville? I would say that Alabama has really been, you know, to put things in context, you know, I've sold rental properties in other markets, you know, Memphis and Dallas, Houston. And in my book, I played a lot of sports. Alabama is that unsung hero. Not a lot of people are aware of what is happening in the state but it is extremely advantageous to an investor when they're looking for long-term cash flow stability, a consistent year-over-year return. And it all really comes down to just aligning yourself with the right team who does a phenomenal job on the renovation piece of it for maintenance and keep those costs down and the capital flowing into your pocket. So I don't know, maybe 10 years from now, Alabama is not the hot market for me. Maybe it's something else. But right now in this time block in space, Alabama is, for me, that little unsung hero that offers a lot more than what people expect. Yeah, and you will have already locked in your real estate price if you buy here in 2019 or 2020. Who knows what changes the decades will bring. Maureen, it's been great having you back on the show. If you want to learn more about the Birmingham market, like a lot of you already have, get the report that's put there for you at getricheducation.com slash Birmingham or the new market, GetRichEducation.com slash Huntsville. Maureen, it's been great having you back on the show. Thank you. Oh, great stuff from a great guest as usual. To review some things from our chat, to tenants, affordability and proximity to work are the two main factors in deciding where to live. They're both more important than school district, To investors, you, as long as you're in a good market, rent-to-value ratio matters the most. That has the most to do with your profitability. Next after that is property tax rate. And on an absolute basis, Alabama has the lowest property tax among all 50 states. So then, is Alabama the best state of all 50 for real estate investors? I'm not really sure. It depends on how you slice it, but I would put it in the running. There are also some other states that are quite good. Arkansas is famously landlord friendly, and there are some other states in there too. In buy and hold real estate, for you, it's really not so much about what's happening in the next 12 months. It's about the long term, and Alabama meets a lot of the long term trends that tenants and residents find preferable because Alabama is low cost, it's low tax, and it's a warm weather state for residents and tenants. By MSA population, Birmingham is Alabama's largest city and Huntsville is second. So Huntsville, Alabama, we discussed its growth. And over the years, I've known a lot of investors personally that have successfully owned rental property there. If you see cash flowing Alabama rental property, You can't make any money from the property that you don't own. 
I suggest getting a hold of the Birmingham and or Huntsville market reports. It's more efficient for the provider when you get the reports because that helps answer a lot of your preliminary questions. And then on the report, you've also got the best provider contact information. So get the report and get involved at getricheducation.com slash Birmingham and getricheducation.com slash Huntsville. I'm Keith Weinhold, and I'll be back next week to help you build your wealth. Don't quit your daydream. Nothing on this show should be considered specific, personal, or professional advice. Please consult an appropriate tax, legal, real estate, financial, or business professional for individualized advice. Opinions of guests are their own. Information is not guaranteed. All investment strategies have the potential for profit or loss. The host is operating on behalf of Get Rich Education, LLC, exclusively. The preceding program was brought to you by your home for wealth building, GetRichEducation.com.